Good morning. So good to see you here today. Glad that you made it. We have some guests here today. We have some folks that drove all the way from Texas to be with us this morning. And uh, we're grateful for them to be here. Hey, before I get started in my message, I want to apologize for the Haiti video. I thought the video was great. I think it was, it's an incredible tool that we'll be able to use and share in a lot of churches and get sponsorships and get support for, uh, for our work there. But if I had known, and, and I didn't see it until it got here, but if I had known Pastor Nicholas was going to have on a Virginia Tech shirt, I would have, I mean, I know Greg McDilda was behind this somehow. He sent that over there. But I would have sent a WVU shirt, or Marshall even, and uh, had, him, had him wear that. Anyway, uh, I hope you get to meet Pastor Nicholas one day. We're going to bring him over, uh, we hope to, Lord willing, and, uh, and, and he's going to be able to talk to you. Well, we're in a series on uh, Revelation. If you're new, if you're your first time here uh, ever or first time in a long time, we've been in this series uh, from Revelation. Revelation is one of those books that people, you know, either cower back from or dive into. You know, they, they, they're just kind of afraid of it because of all the symbolism and the imagery and uh, the wild, fascinating things that are in it. Or they jump in with both feet and they get some sense of understanding and then they lock in and some of them get dogmatic, some of them remain open to other ideas. But it's, uh, it's an incredible book, Revelation is. Now we, we're just kind of in the first part of this series. I know many of you are looking forward to us getting into the, to the second part, <clears throat> but the first part is basically this view of Jesus, unlike we've seen him anywhere else. You know, in the Gospels he was, uh, he was, uh, he was human, he was there. He was touching people, he was healing them, he was weeping over them, and soft and gentle Savior kind of look at Jesus. But now we see the full Jesus in this book, in Revelation. In, in the very first chapter of Revelation, we see a majestic Jesus, a divine Jesus. And he's, he, you know, he's got eyes that, uh, with like fire that burn right through you. His feet are like bronze, and he's got authority, and he's got a double-edged sword coming out of his mouth and he's going to come to judge the nations and rule with an iron scepter if you will and so that's not, we're not used to seeing that kind of Jesus because we're used to the Jesus meek and mild but I want to tell you the next time Jesus returns uh, he won't be riding a donkey and he won't be uh, you know uh, uh, reaching down to touch uh, the, the blind. At that point, the Bible says all will be changed. All will be changed and he will come as our king. The king of kings and lord of lords, the Bible says, will be tattooed across his, uh, his uh, leg. <clears throat> so, this is a different book. We don't want to miss the forest for the trees. A lot of people get fixated on one thing or one view of this book and they miss the big big view and really we've, we've already covered that we covered it in the first message and that's to be ready isn't it it's that God wins so we need to be ready and so we've been looking over the last few weeks at these letters you know he starts the book John receives this revelation and Jesus wants to say something to his church that's why the first part of the series is called when he comes to church when Jesus comes to church what would he say if he were to walk in all sash and, and uh, uh, you know, sandaled up in, in, in his full divine robe? What would he say to the church? What would he say to Gateway? What would he say to your home church? What would he say to the American church? And that's what we're hearing, these messages. So we've been covering them two at a time. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, the first, the first message was he's the head of the church. And then we looked at uh, Ephesus and Laodicea. We talked about the heart. He said, you've lost your first love. And, uh, you know, then we moved on into uh, Sardis, and we've, we've, looked at, uh, we've looked at the hope of the church, these churches that were being persecuted, the Church of Philadelphia, that, the, the afflictions and the, you know, I, I use that word flipson, the Greek word that means to squeeze, to squeeze, and they were being squeezed by Romans and by, uh, by Jews. They were being pushed on every side to throw in the towel on their faith. Last week, we looked at the honor of the church. We looked at Pergamum, and, uh, and you know, we were, we're looking at a church that kind of compromised morally and doctrinally. Today, we're going to look at another aspect of the church. We're going to look at the health of the church, the health of the church. It's, it's kind of like if, if Jesus were our doctor, 
If he were our doctor, we would go to the doctor. Which reminds me of the story of the guy who went to the doctor, and he got in to see the doctor, and he said, Doc, I'm worried about my wife. He said, what's wrong with your wife? He said, she can't hear her. And the doc said, really? He said, yes, she can't hear. I talk to her all the time, and she won't answer me. And I, I'm afraid she's going deaf. <clears throat> what should I do? The doc said, well, what you need to do is, uh, you know, when she's facing away from you, like maybe washing the dishes or something, get behind her, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 feet, and talk to her and see, uh, you know, if she'll answer you, and then move in. You'll see how bad her hearing really is. So he did that. He said, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. He's thinking, oh, my goodness, bless her heart. My wife's going deaf. What am I going to do? So he gets a little bit closer. He gets to like 10 feet, and he says, honey, what's for dinner? No answer. So by this time, he's getting a little frustrated. It's like, how am I going to live with this woman who's going deaf? What am, how am I going to communicate with her? And so uh, he gets right on top of her, and he says, honey, what's for dinner? She said, for the third time, chicken. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, sometimes... The health problem is yours. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying here today. It's like, look, there's a health problem here. But the good thing we're going to find out about this church, and this is the church of Thyatira. Some people say Thyatira. You can pronounce it any way you want to. Uh, but this is the last church. We've looked at six. This is the last one. This, this city was the smallest city of all the seven cities that Jesus wrote letters to that he addressed. And remember... And I shouldn't have to say this, because you know this if you're a student of the Bible, that, that God's message to a church is a message to the church. So God's word is living and active. And so if it applied to the people in the first century, it can apply to you and me today. That's what makes the Bible unique. That's what makes it alive. The Holy Spirit speaks through it even today. So this church, uh, although it had its problems and its good things, so do we. And so we need to hear that message, not just from a historical standpoint, but how does this apply to us today? So we're going to look at the health of the church. And the, the text, uh, the letters found in Revelation 2, this is the last one. While this is the smallest city, it's the longest letter. It's the longest letter. And unlike any of the other letters, this letter is heavy on compliment. It's heavy on commendation. Some of the other letters we... You know, Jesus didn't even give a compliment. He just jumped right into condemning them and telling them their correction. Here's what you need to do. This letter has some condemnation, but it has a lot of compliment, a lot of good things. And uh, we need to hear them. We need to hear them and continue in them. If you go to a doctor <clears throat> and he says, hey, you're doing good, keep doing what you're doing, then we need to keep doing that. If you've changed your eating, if you've changed this or that, keep doing that because things are looking good. Take care of this, take care of that, but keep doing this. So, let's read a couple verses. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God. I love these titles, by the way, of Jesus. You can study these. It can be a study all themselves. Whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. That shows some authority, doesn't it? Somebody who sees all. He sees right to the core of your being, and he stands with authority. I know your deeds, your love, and faith, your service, and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. I want to look at these four words, because I think these are what would indicate a healthy church. This is what he's looking for, and he says, I see them in you. I see this. I see four qualities in you that I like, and I want you to continue. I see your love. I see your faith. I see your service. I see your perseverance. And that's what a doctor wants to see. So if we were going to a doctor, and, uh, and we had our love checked out. <clears throat> you know, this is kind of the equivalent of, of a doctor coming out with this. What is this? It's a stethoscope. And uh, he put that on our chest or maybe on our back to hear our lungs or to hear our heart or maybe to hear the blood pumping through our arteries, things like that. He's trying to find out, you know, what's inside? What is, how, how is your heart beating? How smooth is it running down there? What's the very core of you? And with a simple instrument, though complex in what it can do, uh, these medical instruments are amazing, aren't they? There's some incredible medical equipment that we have today. But the doctor can tell us so much just in listening to your heart beat. My daughter's 
My two oldest ones are nurses, and they were talking the other day about the sound of a heart murmur. I said, how do you know they've got a heart murmur? And if you're in the medical community, you probably know this. Instead of a thump, thump, it's a swish, swish. I didn't know that. So they can tell so much from uh, using this instrument and putting on your chest or wherever. And so he's going to look at our love. <clears throat> Jesus said, all men, he told this to his disciples, will know that you're my followers, you're my disciples, by how you love. By how you love. Now, there are a lot of churches who would like to be measured by other things. Uh, for instance, there are churches who might want to be measured by how many people come. Or they might be uh, measured or want to be measured by, you know, how uh, the worship service is or how it goes, how uh, traditional, non-traditional, progressive, uh, upbeat, or whatever. Some churches may be measured, they want to be measured by their children's ministry or student ministry. And we can go on down the list that some Things churches put up there is this is what's important, this is what needs to be important. But I want to tell you, when Jesus looks at our church, when, the first thing he looks for is what kind of a, a loving church is this? Is this a church of love? Do they love me? Do they love people? You know, that's our vision statement, and the vision statement of a lot of churches love God, love people. He said that's the two greatest commandments, didn't he? When asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second greatest is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus lived a life of love. He told stories about love. And so when he looks at his people, his church, just like he said here to his disciples, here's what I want to see. It's, I don't want to see right doctrine first. I want to see love. Now, that, I know that bothers a lot of us who might think that, hey, it's all about being right. It's about having right doctrine. It's about being right on all the issues. It's about standing in the right place. It's about doing things the right way. Jesus says, that's important. It's important to be right. But what's more important is to be love. God is love. You think about that the next time you come up on a situation where I can love this person or I can be right. That's the great challenge in Christianity today, especially in modern America, is that we have to learn as Christians to balance God's love with God's truth. You see, in a recent survey, they asked people born after 1967, around 1970 and beyond, that could answer this question. They asked them, when you think of the church, what do you think of? What's one word? When you think of Christians in America today, what's the word that you think of? Now, we would like to think it's the word love. That's what we want it to Think. We, when people, when they think about the church, when they talk about us on TV shows or, uh, uh, you know, when they depict us in movies or on, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, news shows, that, that they would say, oh, those are the most loving people. But this is the word that they came up with. This is the most common answer that was given. Oh, Christians, they're judgmental. They're judgmental. Wow, that hurts, doesn't it? That's an indictment on the American church today. That we've got so caught up in wanting to be right that we forgot how to love people. And here's what we do. Oftentimes we, we want to judge people to live by Christian standards who aren't Christians. We want to say, hey, why aren't you living right? And they're not even Christians. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not being fed a diet of God's word or God's truth. How can we expect people who aren't Christians to live right? So we got to stop doing that. But you know what else we got to stop doing? As Christians, we got to stop living wrong. You see, the biggest hypocrisy, and this is what we see all over the church, is when Christian people don't get it right. When Christian people say, you know what, I'm just going to live like the world. Our divorce rate is the same. The abortion rate among young Christian girls is the same or higher. And we could just go on down the list. The couples living together outside of marriage is the same. So look, if we're going to claim to be Christian, we need to live like it. And stop holding people to a standard that we shouldn't be holding them to, especially if they're not Christians. People say, well, you can't judge me. If you're a Christian... Absolutely, I can judge you. If you're a Christian, you need to be judged. People say, well, what about judge not? Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. 
I think when Jesus was talking there, he was talking to people who didn't have kingdom values. They didn't have the values of the kingdom. But when the apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, he said, judge one another. Judge one another. You got a guy here living with his, his father's, uh, you know, his, his father died. He left his, uh, his uh, stepmother. This guy's now shacking up with his stepmother. And you people in the church are okay with that. You're not saying a word to him. You're like, oh, we don't want to judge him. We don't want him to be mad at us. We don't want, to, we don't want him to leave the church. Paul said, you need to judge one another. You need to help one another. <clears throat> Maybe instead of the word judge, we should use the word hold accountable. Hold accountable. We need to hold each other accountable. If you're a Christian, and I'm a Christian, we need to be able to say, hey, you need to get back in line. We don't do that. We don't live that way. We don't practice that. We're Christians. Let's get this right. We're afraid to do that. I'm afraid. But judgmental is the word uh, that they use. And I, I think we've got to change this. I addressed this a little bit last month in my Life on Mission series, how when people look at us, they... They don't like the church, they like our Jesus, but they don't like the church because they think we're too judgmental. What if we could find a way to love first and then share the truth in a loving way? Build a relationship with someone. Get them to the point to where they allow you to speak into their life, where you can say, you know, this is not really the, what, the thing that we should be doing. You see, it's hard for me to speak into your life if I don't know you, if I haven't known you very long. But once I get to know you, I need to be able to say that to you. And it's the same you for me. Pastors need to be held accountable to things. So we need to, we need to highlight the word love. Craig Groeschel is a preacher at Life Church TV, and he tells a story of being a young preacher, and he was filling in for someone... <clears throat> Uh, you know, just starting out, out of college, he was filling in for this guy, one of his friends, and he came to the church early, and the secretary met him and said, hey, we're going to have a visitor today. And Groeschel said, how do you know that? How do you know you're going to have a visitor? And the secretary said, well, she called this morning. She called early, and she asked for directions, and she said she had tried everything else in her life. Now she was going to try church. So we think she's going to be here today. So uh, Groeschel's standing out by the door with this greeter. His name's Virgil. He's an older guy, and he's been in the church a long time. And uh, they're standing there waiting for this young woman to come. Groeschel is. And uh, Virgil goes on a rant about young people today and how they dress and all that they listen to and all that stuff. And he's angry. And so this, uh, people are coming in, you know, in their suits and ties and long dresses and looking really cleaned up and good. And, and finally, uh, they're, they're, this car pulls up. It didn't look like any of the other cars <clears throat> in the lot. The tires uh, were low on pressure, and they were balding, and they were squealing, and they had dents in them, and it was dirty, and, uh, and this woman gets out, and she's a younger woman, but she's not dressed like everybody else. She's got these tight uh, pants on and this tight blouse, and, and uh, she's putting a cigarette out as she gets out of her car, and so she's not quite... And Groeschel was standing there, and he watched her get out of her car, and he was like, he was trying to think of, you know, what would be the right thing to say here. He's a young preacher. Before he could say anything, Virgil opens the door and says, hey, we wear our best when we come to church. What do you think you're doing? And he said, almost on cue, the woman turned around, got in her car, and drove off. And I wonder how many people come to church and get beat up like that. They just get punched in the gut. Say, you're not good enough to be here. You don't have your act together. You, you don't smell like us or dress like us or look like us or drive what we drive. You, you need to go. We can't do that, can we? Look, if the church can't accept people into it who, whose lives are messed up, we shouldn't really be called the church, should we? We shouldn't be called the church. So <clears throat> we need to get rid of that word. Groeschel says we impress people by our strengths, but we connect with people through our weaknesses. Nevertheless, he said, I hate that I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel. We're going to talk about Jezebel in just a second, but I want you to look at this word tolerance. Now, here's our problem in America today, in American Christianity. Here's the problem we're having. Words have been redefined for us, and this is a word that has been redefined. It used to be the, the definition of tolerance was that you and I could have different views and still be friends. 
You could believe one thing, and I could believe one thing. I could believe you're wrong. You could believe I'm wrong, but we're still friends. We can get along. We can coexist. And that's still a definition of tolerance, but the problem today is that tolerance has been expanded, and the, and the definition now is that we, we can have different views, but you have to say not just that you will accept me, but that my view is equally true as your view. You understand what I mean? So if I believe in, in anything, you know, on a big social issue where we know God's word speaks against this, but if, if I believe it, then you have to say, it's right, okay, it's right, it's right for you. It's called moral relativism, by the way. That's the definition of tolerance now. Not only do you have to accept me, you have to agree with me. You have to say that this is equally true and valid. And that makes it hard for us as Christians to do that because we can't do that. We can't. So what we have to do in this culture is find a way to balance God's love with God's truth. And I wish I had all the answers in every situation, but I don't. But that's what you have to do when you're out there in the world. Balance his love with his truth. Josh McDowell defines this for us like this. <clears throat> he says, tolerance says you must approve of what I do, but love responds, I must do something harder. I will love you even when your behavior offends me. Tolerance says, you must agree with me, but love responds, I must do something harder. I will tell you the truth because I'm convinced that the truth will set you free. Tolerance says, you must allow me to have my way, but love says, no, I must do something harder. I will plead with you to follow God's way because I believe that you are worth the risk. You see, it's, we talk about relational discipleship. It's about building a relationship with someone. If I don't have a relationship with you, I can't speak truth into your life. I could yell at you but that's not going to do any good. You see, yelling at people doesn't turn people around. It turns them away. It turns them away. And you might think, well, why do you want to turn me around? What we want to do is point you toward Jesus. Point you toward Jesus. And he'll do the, the fixing of me and of you and everybody else. So our job primarily is to love. It's to love. Well, there's a, a second quality that he looks at here, and it's his faith. Now think of Romans 10, 17, where Paul, the apostle, said faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is through the word of God. So it's about what you hear. So you get faith by hearing. So the doctor might use one of these. Do you know what this is? That's an otoscope, auto referring to the ear. That's an otoscope. That's where he looks for brain matter, you know. He points that in your ear, and he looks to see if you have a brain. And if light comes out the other side, you know, you might have half a brain. You might have had surgery. No, that's where he's checking for, you know, things in your ear, maybe obstructions. He might be looking at the wax buildup. He could be looking, you know, I don't know what doctors look for in this. You talk to the next time they look in your ear. What are you looking for in there? And uh, they might do tone, you know, uh, tests and things like that to see how well your hearing is. So <clears throat> that's an otoscope. And that's kind of the thing about faith is that uh, people, you know, develop their faith really according to what they hear in their life. So if you hear something long enough, that's who you'll become. You take a child. If you share off-collar jokes or if you, uh, you know, if you talk in a certain way with uh, filthy language to it when a child's around, what's that child going to do? He's going to go to school, and that's what he's going to share, and that's what he's going to do. And you're going to be like, uh-oh, he's caught my faith. Well, why? Because he heard you say that. And that's, that's what we're talking about here. That's, that's how we develop our faith. Our faith is being developed by hearing what we hear. God's word, people talk about it, and other things. So we need to really talk about what's going in. That's where Jesus says this. He says, I, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel. Say that name with me, Jezebel. One, two, three. Jezebel. Jezebel. Well, it just sounds evil, doesn't it? Jezebel. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children, what's that word? Dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to to your deeds. That's pretty strong words there. You're talking about Jezebel. He's going to strike her children dead. 
You see, Jezebel is a, an actual person in the Old Testament. She was the wife of King Ahab, and she was evil. She led people into sexual immorality. She worshiped idols. She's the one, if you remember, Elijah, Elijah ran from her. Elijah had just killed the prophets of Baal. He had that great meeting on the, on the Mount Carmel, and, and all those prophets were killed by God through his prayers. And then he ran because he heard uh, uh, Jezebel say, you killed my prophets, and I'm going to kill you. And so he ran and he hid under the street and he wanted to die because this woman was chasing him, Jezebel. She killed a man one time because he wouldn't sell her his vineyard, Naboth. She just killed him. She was evil as evil comes. In fact, we use that word today. Sometimes you might hear somebody say, she's, she's a Jezebel. I hope you don't hear that and maybe you shouldn't use that around your children. They might ask you, but you just tell her, you know, she's not so nice. And that's something that's going on here in the, in the church at Thyatira. Either it's a woman, a specific woman who's usurping authority or undermining or trying to teach something, or I'm more inclined to believe that it was a teaching. It was some kind of teaching that Jesus, you know, was referring back to. You know, remember Jezebel, how she was misleading people? That's what's going on with this teaching. And when he says, I will strike her children dead, what he means is, look, I don't want any descendants of this teaching. I don't want you propagating this to the next generation. This garbage needs to die here and now. And there are things, you know, some bad stuff out there, bad teaching, false doctrine. You know, it sounds good. The Bible says that our ears will be tickled by it it kind of sounds good and we'll buy into it we were talking the other day about the jim jones tragedy in guyana where he 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 convinced almost a thousand people to follow him down there and then most of them drank the kool-aid or had it injected into them how do you, how does that happen how do normal people do that you say they're not normal surely some of them were normal but they started hearing a little bit of what they liked and before you know it they were in with both feet and they wouldn't abandon that teaching that that's what's going on here. And things like that have happened all over, you know, history. Uh, the Nazis did that. Hitler convinced them, this is the right thing. We need to have a pure race. And we could go throughout history and see mass exterminations of people. And you think, how do people buy into that garbage where they start hearing a little bit, and before you know it, they're hearing a lot, and they're buying into it. That's what's happening, and it's happening in a lot of churches. We call it cheap grace, easy religion. Hey, are you comfortable? Is the temperature okay for you? Are those seats all right? Uh, we can get you some reclining seats. You know, we've looked into that. Because we want to make you comfortable. Does that music offend you? We'll turn it down for you. Oh, you don't like that style? We'll change that. Well, what, what's happening over there in the children's ministry? I'll fi we'll fire them. We'll talk to them. We'll take care of it. My daughter's headed back to Florida. See you, honey. That's okay. You can go on. I love you. They have to fly out. Uh, I thought they... I know she did. I thought they were going to wait until I finished. <clears throat> they thought he's going on forever. So, you see what I'm saying? See what I'm doing? There's this, there's this mentality now in the American church that the church exists for me, to make me comfortable, to make it easy for me. The church exists, and the preacher exists for me. That's false doctrine. That's false teaching. Absolutely, and, and it's one that many churches, maybe people here, buy into and think that's normal. That's normal. It's all about me. It's all about me. Isn't that what church is about? To meet my needs, to help my family. And so we have, to, we have to be rid of this. That's what's going on with the American church. That's why, it's, that's why it's hurting today. It's because we're winning people with a false doctrine. We're telling them, hey, we're all about you. Whatever you want, we'll change it so you can be happy here. You just want you to be comfortable. That's false doctrine. Listen, my job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. And every now and then when you come in here, you should have your toes stepped on. 
like I do in my study. Or you should, you should really be kicked in the hind end because you're not moving like you should. Whoever has ears, let him hear. That's what should go in, not the garbage that you hear a lot. The third quality is the word service. Service. <clears throat> this, is, this is the quality that you could say is love and faith in action. It's love and faith in action. So if you go to a doctor, he, he may say, hey, you should get you one of these. You know what this is? What is that? It's a pedometer. What does that measure? It measures your steps. Your steps. I wear a Fitbit. How many of you wear a Fitbit? Raise it up. Swing it like this. Yeah, I thought it was doing good because I had 10,000 steps as my goal. And then somebody said, you know, you can just wave your arm and get more steps. I said, no way. So I checked it out and I waved my arm and said, dad, go on, I got 25 more steps. So I wasn't as happy with myself. What Tim, my buddy here, calls it a fat bit. So, um, well, what's this for? Well, it's to measure, you know, how many steps are you taking? How much exercise are you getting? Because, listen, if you're just showing up on Sunday and you're taking it all in, and then when it comes time to get a little uncomfortable and get out there and serve, or step up and serve in children's ministry, or student ministry, or some kind of an event like yesterday's event, the hunger walk, if you say, oh, no, I'm too busy for that. Oh, no, no, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I would, you know, I just don't know what to say. I wouldn't know what to say if somebody asked me a question. Or, oh, no, I, I would never... You know, I can't even keep my own house clean. Why would I go clean somebody else's street or business or... I can't... My own fence needs painting. Why would I paint your fence? So if, if that's your mentality, if your first thought when an opportunity to serve comes up, if your first thought is, I don't know what am I doing that day. I don't know if I am available. Then if that's always your first thought, then that might be a problem. Don't we pay somebody to do that? Can I pay somebody to do that? Look, you can't buy your way through service. You can't do that. In fact, there was an interesting article uh, not too long ago in the LA Times that talked about depression. <clears throat> you know the people who are most depressed in our culture today, according to the study? Now, there, the depression is, it hits all ages and has no respect of persons. But this study de this, uh, determined that the people who were most depressed in America were the younger people. They were young people. And the reason the study determined was that the culture has preached for years the exaltation of self. That, hey, this is all about you. It's all about you. And when you don't get what you think you should get, you're sad. And depressed. You know, Facebook has really contributed to this because we do the comparison game on Facebook, don't we? I can't believe he got that new car. And I need a new car. I'm going to go in debt and get me one. And so we, we play this comparison game and it's all about us. I, I want to... And so, listen, service is the one thing you can do that's not about you. And if it is, you're not doing it right. Service is about... Somebody else. What are you doing that would help somebody else serve? Love God, love people, serve. So, uh, I, you know, our deeds, our service will not earn us a spot in heaven. And it won't keep our spot in heaven. God's not going to say, you haven't served, so I'm kicking you out. But because we've been saved, because God has been so good to us, this is who we are. This is what we do. We, we get involved. So I would, I would say, if you want to measure, if you want to measure this part of your spiritual life, what you need to ask yourself, have I been in a situation in the last three months where I didn't really want to be? I didn't have time to be there. I, I didn't want to be there. I was uncomfortable for me to be there. But I was there because so-and-so needed me there. If you can say, yeah, I've had a situation like that, then you're probably doing this right. 
But if you say, you know what, <laughs> gosh, I don't remember anything I've done recently that I didn't want to be there. Now, I'm not saying that service is a thing you don't want to do, but I'm saying sometimes there are things that have to be done, and somebody has to step up and do them. Jesus said, inasmuch as you have done it unto who? The least of these, you've done it unto me. So this is who we are. We're, we're going to be judged by our deeds, 1 Corinthians 5.10. Well, the last quality is the quality of perseverance. That's what he said in the beginning. He said, I, I see your deeds, see your love, your faith, your service, and your perseverance. Eugene Peterson defined perseverance as obedience, a long obedience in the same direction. In other words, you've been committed to this, you're still committed to this, you'll always be committed to this. A long obedience in the same direction. It's like, a, it's like a, an old man making his way to the bathroom. He's going. You're not going to stop him. I'm not moving fast, but I'm moving. I don't know why I said bathroom. I, I didn't. It just came into my head. It's, a, it's just keep going. Problems will come your way, obstacles, and you just got to keep going. When, when you get squeezed, when the pressure's on, you just keep going. Like the ever ready bunny, you know, you just keep moving. That's perseverance. I've thought about it. I've been here almost 20 years <clears throat> in this church. That's amazing to me. My parents are here today. And my mom gave me five years. She sentenced me to five years here. So I'm on 20. And I've thought about it. a lot of people who used to go to this church. There are a lot of people, and not every church is like this. You could go to every church. You could say, hey, how many people have you lost over the years? I'd say we've lost a lot. I wonder sometimes, you know, why did, why did they leave? You know, some of them had life changed. Some of them moved away. Some of them got mad, got their feelings hurt. Some of them, you know, might have wanted something different in church. And we could just go on and on and talk about why people leave a church. And, you know, it doesn't bother me as much if people leave a church as it would as if they leave the faith. Because there may be times when you think, you know, I could do more over here. And if that's why you're leaving, that's great. That's awesome. But talk to me first because there's more here to do. There's more here to do. You just may think, oh, they've got that handle. They're a big enough church they can do that. I could tell you there's more to do here. Uh, but, and you could do it. You could do it. You, you, you just come up to me and say, hey, what could I do? I could give you, I could tell you some things you could do. So don't think oh, they don't need me there. They're a big enough church they don't need there's stuff to do. There's more to do. But if, if, if you're just leaving to do something else, that's fine. But just keep, keep, make sure you keep moving in the right direction. That's perseverance. So maybe you've been on one of these. You know, that's what the doctor's trying to find out when he puts you on a machine like this or something looks like a treadmill. It's a stress test. He's measuring how long can you go? How far can you go? Can you climb the next mountain? The next time a problem comes in your life, are you going to throw in the towel? Are you going to lay down? Are you going to give up? That's your adversity quotient. Your adversity quotient. Paul Stoltz wrote a, wrote a book called your, your AQ. How high is your AQ? Your adversity quotient. He compared people to climbing a mountain. He said some people get to the, to the base camp and it gets too cold for them and they turn around. Some people get halfway up and the air gets thin and the climate gets tough and the storms start coming and they say, no, I can't do this. I'm going back. He said, but of all those people, about 5% get up there and they say, I'm not going back. I'm going up. I'm going forward. And they have a high AQ, adversity quotient. So it doesn't matter what happens in their life. They're not going to throw in the towel on their faith. They're not going to stop loving God and serving him. I like what he says here. <clears throat> I say to the rest of you, to you who do not uh, hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose on you any burden except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. And this is, I don't have time to explain these verses, but it's about authority. It's about royalty. And this is the last verse that we skipped over, uh, we read earlier, but it says that you are now doing more than you did at first. That's a good, that would be great if Jesus would come and say, hey, you, you guys, 
you're doing more than you did at first. So your chart, when the doctor looks at you, he says, hey, how you doing with the weight loss? How you doing with the exercise? How you doing with the meds? Oh, you're doing better today. Everything's better. I hope that's the message we hear uh, when we get our medical checkup, our spiritual medical checkup. Stand up with me. I'm going to pray for you. And uh, I'm going to pray that you get a good report. Lord, thank you today for your, your belief in us. I, I pray, God, that we would be able to stand in front of you and be measured by you healthy. Not just a healthy Christian, but a healthy church. And that we would measure not by the standards that we often do when we come into a church, but we would measure by your standards. Are our people going outside the walls of the building and helping people who are in need, people who've been addicted to drugs, people who have weighty decisions in their life to make, whether to keep the child or to abort, people, God, who are living in poverty and under bridges and homeless shelters, people who are suffering and grieving. Are our people out there doing that? God, measure us by that and help us to toe the line and say we're, we're headed in the same direction. We're still doing what we're doing. We're doing it better. We're headed to our Savior. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. This is an important time right now. If you're here today and you think the Holy Spirit has spoken through his word to your heart and you want to commit your life to Christ, I would, I'm going to invite you to come and talk to me as I stand over there. Maybe today you're going to follow up that decision with baptism. That's what people did in the book of Acts. Then they came to Christ. They trusted him. And then they were baptized. Maybe you want to do that today. If you're here today and you want to put roots down in this place. You've kind of been a Christian without a church home. And it's kind of easy to do that because you're not really obligated. And once you put both feet in, you're obligated. Because this is now your church. It's not that church. It's not their church. It's my church. So I'm going to invite you to come. If you have a decision to make, maybe you just need prayer. I'll invite you to come talk to me during this song.